Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this presentation is about uh, text tagging and finite state transducers. Um, it's principally about the latter, FSTs, by way of uh, a project um, about text tagging in the context of geospatial tagging. So about me first, um, I'm the book author of um, Apache Solar Enterprise Search Server. I'm working on the update as we speak. Um, not literally right now, of course, but <laughs> last night in my hotel room. Um, I've been doing, uh, working at MITRE for a good number of years. Uh, it's a good company. Um, specializing in search lately. Um, on the um, Lucene uh, PMC committer list. And I've spoken at a couple presentations before. Um, so what, is, uh, what are these, these subjects? Some of you might be wondering what these things are. Um, and uh, if these are new to you, I think that's awesome. Because uh, if you already know what FSTs are, you might already realize that how cool this really is. So I'm hoping that a lot of you are new to this because um, FSTs are really awesome. It's, it's a tool in my tool chest when I go to solve a problem, certain types of problems. And it's, it's pretty phenomenal um, what they're all about. But for me to, in order for me to really talk about um, FSTs, I'm going to describe to you how I applied it. What was the context, uh, a, a problem I, I came into, and about how I, how I used FSTs to solve that problem. So. Um, there's a project, well, first of all, there's a government organization called JADO, Joint IED Defense Organization. Uh, I work for MITRE. We're supporting that defense organization. And they, there's an uh, open source project called Open Sexton. Um, I'm glad I can say it's open source now. We just recently open sourced it uh, a few days ago, literally. It's on GitHub. Um, this pres presentation isn't primarily about Open Sexton. I'm using that, that the context of a, of a problem that that project has to solve a, a certain technical task and how I solve that, that task. Open Sexton is a geotagging solution. Um, there are other similar words I, I hear out there, and sometimes there's ambiguity about what, what are you really talking about. What I'm talking about here is taking natural language, whether it be uh, a Word document or a web page or whatever, and identifying the substrings of that text that refer to a place. Um, so it's finding place name references in natural language. Um, so there's a little example there. I live near Boston. I just underscored that Boston. Um, and the, the output of, of a geotagger is a list of place names and the character offsets into that text. OK. Um, and it requires a gazetteer. I mean, after all, this is code that's going to involved here. But that code needs data to know that Boston is such a place. And there's some fancy natural language processing invo involved as well. So what a gazetteer is, I use that word, that's basically the, the corpus, the, the name corpus, if you will, that, that has a, an, uh, an entry in there for Boston. And it says what lat lawn it's at, though it's not pertinent for this part of the problem. Some other metadata associated with it. But basically, it's a big list of names of places. And there's a, Open Sexton has a UI on it. Uh, it's, mostly, it's mostly used in a back end process and a big batch process that's inputting documents and doing entity name extraction. What I didn't mention is why this stuff is useful. So um, it's used, for, used in a couple places in some projects that I'm on. So in one case, you want to do spatial entity extraction to, so that when you're showing facets, you can show the places that are referred to in text. That's one use case. Another use case is. Uh, because you have the lat long associated with these places that you're extracting. So then, then you can do, you have a map, and then you can kind of get the idea where it goes from there. It becomes a spatial search problem. OK, so um, this is the architecture diagram for open, for open Sexton as a whole. Um, and when I was, uh, I was asked to come and help this project for a specific task in, in all of this that they have going on, they, they showed me this diagram, and then they pointed it right here. Bang, right there. That's a problem. And we're hoping that you can make it scale. So the thing is, um, you know, documents come in. At the very end, we, we have output of, of named locations and, and, t and uh, offset char character offsets. But there's, the way I look at it, there's really two big parts of what's going on here. There's the text tagger. There's a, what's called the naive tagger right there in the middle. Um, that wasn't my choice of words. Um, it's a bit derogatory, I guess. But basically, this, this centerpiece right there what it's doing is it's, um, it's, doing a, it's somewhat dumb, but it has to scale. And it's basically doing a very basic um, matching of text um, into, into a dictionary without, without any fancy natural language processing. So it's, so it's very high on recall and very low in terms of precision. Then there's fancy 
natural language processing that follows that. I'm not an expert on those parts. I don't pretend to be. Other PhDs in our project focused on the, la the later stages. And that's where the real, I'd say, intellectual property is of open section. It's in those fancy rules that follow. But it needs to start with a bunch of possi possibilities that it can then rule out as, because just because the word Boston is found in text doesn't mean it's actually the Boston US. It could be, there's other Bostons out there. It could be some guy named Boston. You know, how do you really know? So it's a hard problem. But the big part of what makes it scale or not scale is, is, is the naive tagger portion. It was, it's dominated by how fast that works. The, the NLP rules, uh, and relative to the, the rest of it, run very fast compared to this, this problem here. So the, the so-called naive tagger, I, otherwise I'll just call it text tagger. So it's somewhat conceptually simple in what it has to do. It basically needs to look in a big dictionary, a list of names, really and figure out where are there matches in my text list of names. Seems pretty simple. No, no fancy NLP, not really. And there's nothing geospatial about it, by the way. So I like to think this is useful outside of geospatial, outside of the Open Section project. But it's actually not so simple because, well, it's not like you can take, take each word at a time and then simply look it up. It's really variable length words because these are like name phrases, I like to call them, because you know, um, you know, New York City, you know. Um, and this overlapping names. So we don't want to have names within names. So you want the longest substring. And so there's issues. So it's not, um, you could write some trivial loop, but it wouldn't necessarily scale. And the gazetteer is another aspect of the problem, um, is that this gazetteer has 13 million names in it. Not huge, but it's a bit big to throw in a hash map or something. <laughs> um, and of those 13 million, um, 8.1 million are, are distinct, a lot of duplicates in there because of uh, ambiguous places or uh, once, when I do the matching, I do matching based on a, a, after some basic analysis like lower casing, et cetera, some other things like that. And you might say, well, wait, isn't, isn't case sometimes pertinent to doing matching? And it is. Remember that the job of the naive tagger here, this basic tagger, is to, to produce lots of Lots of high, high recall, low precision results. And let the NLP processing follow on that, that looks at the case and might, does a bunch of other fancy stuff. A um, lot, of, lot of words are one word, but there's many of that are not one word place names. And because it's, it's worldwide, I mean, this isn't just US. This is, there's some, some of those words boil down to English words that are extremely common. Like there might be some, I, I forget some examples, but there's some extremely common ones out there. And believe it or not, some places are extremely ambiguous, like San Diego. There's a buttload of San Diegos out there in the world, apparently. So when you say it's some, you, someone lives in San Diego, I have no idea where you might be. <laughs> um, interesting. So when I came out of this project, there were, there were two existing um, implementations of the so-called naive tagger. There's something called GATE. Um, I, I forget what it stands for. It's a, basically, it's a framework for, it's a pipeline with a, kind of a kitchen sink of a bunch of tools within it for doing some interesting natural language processing. Um, and it has a component in there uh, for a string matching based on something called the Aho Karasik algorithm. Um, so, it's, so the fact that it's based on the Aho Karasik string matching algorithm, that's a very sound basis. It was, um, I believe, it was developed in the 1970s. Whenever you use grep on your computer, you're using that algorithm. So it's sound and good, and that, that's all well and good. However, the, the current imp the implementation of it within Gate was estimated to use about 80 gigs of RAM. So the developers, um, I didn't take that measurement, but the other people on, on the team, when I came in to solve this problem, they said, you know, um, we can never put our full data set in this thing because we don't on our developer machines. You know, we don't have 80 gigs of RAM, and we don't want 80 gigs of RAM to be a requirement for this deployed system. I mean, you can get RAM systems that much RAM, but that's just you know, it's kind of a lot of RAM. <laughs> that's, imagine having a Java heap that big. Um, it's very fast. So before I was involved, they solved this by trying to figure out how to get a database to fix this. And this is a rather marvelous, the fact that, they were, that the other members of the team were even able to figure out how to get a relational database to solve this problem is, is, is very interesting. It was not the right fit for the problem. But nonetheless, they, they got it to work um, with a reasonable amount of RAM. Um, there's some complex stuff going on and how it works. And it's very slow. Um, I forget exactly how, how slow it was, but um, it was something like um, maybe a document a second or something like that was processing through the system. It just wasn't fast enough for the needs that we had. So then um, you know, uh, 
They knew that I was a solar expert. They said, "Well, Dave, you know, we want to use solar more involved in this. Uh, want to use solar more in this project? Maybe solar's got something here." Uh, so I've heard of uh, FSTs before. I've been really impressed by what they can do. So I came in and uh, started working on an FST-based implementation. That's a Lucene FST. I'm going to tell you all about what an FST is in a second. Um, but every, every time it says JADO here, it's, that's the sponsor. It's sort of MITRE working for JADO and developed a bit of a technicality. Finite state transducer. So I ripped off a few slides from Michael McCandless, <laughs> who built the um, who co-built the uh, FST technology in Lucene. So uh, first, a little bit of, of background. Um, this is a, a picture of a finite state automa. Um, it's a pretty simple thing. It's really a set. It's a set of, imagine a set of strings. Of course, the strings don't have to be literally be strings of characters, but um, it can be other data. But it, these analogies work really well when it's character based. So it's like a sorted set. Um, and this, what's nice about this uh, structure here is that there's internal sharing at both the heads and the, 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 at the end in terms of the, 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 uh, the actual nodes. So if you have lots and lots of text strings in here, you can imagine some space savings involved by sharing some nodes in the beginning and the end. Now, a finite state transducer is really a simple extension of that. Imagine um, instead of having a set where you only know if the key is in the set, that's it. You now have a value, so it's like a, it's like a tree set. You can kind of think, I mean, excuse me. You can think of it like a, like a, tr like a sorted map in Java, you, conceptually kind of. In terms of if, you're on, if you don't care about how it works internally, on the surface of it, you can imagine it's the sorted map thing, kind of. Um, internally, it's as it traverses, it, as the internal algorithm traverses the, the nodes, it, it actually accumulates parts of the output value and it kind of adds them up at the end. So there's really, really clever stuff that works internally. You don't, need to be, you don't need to really understand those kinds of details to know that that's really all an FST is. So it's a very fancy sounding thing, finite state transducer, I like saying that. But it's not like, it's, not like it's a big deal. But what is a big deal is Lucene's implementation of FSTs, which is really phenomenal. Um, the, the word FST, um, I, it's fairly new to me. But as I understand it, it's a term that's been around a long time. I don't think it's been interesting until a, uh, a research paper by uh, Mihov and Morrill came out in 01. And it was then, um, which was basically about how to um, encode, encode a long byte array, um, how to encode the FST into a big byte array. So Lucene's, um, yeah, Lucene's implementation, um, it, it, it's highly memory efficient as a big byte array. I mean, if you try to imagine looking at that FST diagram on the screen before I started talking about this. You might imagine how to implement this in Java by having some sort of node class with an edge class. And, and you can kind of imagine how to build this up using basic object, object, object oriented principles. It would be a memory pig in the end. Um, but you could you know, kind of do it. So the, the cool thing that's going on here is that someone figured out how to take that, that graph structure and encode it into a byte array with some really clever techniques that are both uh, optimized for speed um, and, and memory compactness. The fact is this big byte array, you can load it from disk super fast. Um, one of the major, um, it's wonderful, but one of the things you've got to be aware of is that it's write once. So once you build this thing up, once you're done, it's immutable. You can't touch it. If you want to make a new one, you have to, you can make a new one, but you can't add to it. So it's immutable effectively. And the inputs need to be pre-sorted. As you add things to a, an FST builder, as you're working with the API, um, you have to have that, those inputs sorted in advance already. If, it's not, if, if your input data is not sorted, you'll have to sort it a priori, et cetera. So there's some building cost. Um, and they're pretty darn cool. Oh, um, one of the things kind of interesting is that one of the features of the API is that you can use it as um, one use case of, of them is to have a reverse lookup. So imagine if you have lots and lots of strings. And instead of, in your application, having lots and lots of string references running around, imagine if you could instead have a simple integer reference to that big string. So there's a feature where you can use a set of strings um, where each string really uh, it gives you an in integer, a back reference back to that integer. So if you ever need to look up the string, you just call one method to look up the string for it. If you have the string you want to get the integer, you can go back and forth. So it's that's a very, um, so even though the API can be a bit complex, that's one use case for it that I find very, very useful and simple. So how does this apply to text tagging? Well, I looked at the problem I had, and I said, well, I've got 
a lot of words, and I've got word phrases, you know, uh, bunches of words together. So I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll have uh, one FST that has every, every unique word across all of, all of the gazetteer. I'll put that in one FST. That way I can have an integer substitute for that, for that name, just that, that one word of the name, excuse me. Um, so this is my word dictionary. And basically, so imagine um, New York City. This allows me to have an integer substitute for each of those words. So it's a nice integer thing as opposed to some bulky character array reference that's on the heap somewhere. And then I'll have a word phrase FS FST that's based on those IDs. So it's not like these FSTs have to be based on sequences of characters. They can be other things like integers. So in this case, um, the word phrase FST is based off of integer codes for the words that I had. My thinking behind all this was that the nature of these FSTs is that they share prefixes and endings. Well, lots of words share prefixes and suffixes. And lots of word phrases, place name phrases, you know, new whatever, lots of new, new, new this, new that, new the other thing, share you know, prefixes and suffixes. So my, my, my thinking behind this was, was to sort of doubly take advantage of the FSTs by kind of layering them in this fashion. Um, and the results were awesome compared to the um, compared to the 80 gigabytes I was quoted for the uh, Gates implementation. So the, the word dictionary, all 3.3 million unique words, uh, took about 26 megs of RAM. Uh, the name phrase FST was 90. And uh, uh, because all of these word phrases need to point to my primary keys in my gazetteer, there's a bunch of other IDs, the, the, all those integers, I need to point back to them. So um, there's 82 megs of that. So the sum total was about 200 megs or so. So I was super excited to see 200 megs quoting because I remember the problem I was trying to solve was, um, you know, got to be much better than 80 gigs. <laughs> so that is, I was uh, super pleased to see that. Uh, there was a building, uh, even though it's only 200 megs, in order to build this data structure, I needed about one and a half, two gigs worth of heap as I collected the data to build it up. But once I compacted it, put it on disk, um, it's only 200 megs of RAM. And you can actually compact these things. In this case, I can save another 10% on top. I gave this talk before within MITRE, and um, as I, I was thinking, I want to be able to tell people how clever I was by layering two FSTs together. Um, for the reasons that I just gave, I figured it's got to be another order of magnitude better um, than having a single FST that has all the word phrases together. So I did a little experiment beforehand. I kind of modified the code a bit to, to build this thing up, just to see how big this thing was anyway. So a single FST. Um, so the, the entire New York City, as an example, would, would be, have one uh, reference. So I thought it'd be at least, I thought it'd be at least twice as big as the approach that I actually implemented. Um, no, um, if I had done it this way, I would have been having half the memory. So I, was, I thought about, I was about to say how clever I was, but I realized that FSTs are actually so good that I didn't even need to layer the FSTs in such a way I could have done better. And I don't have a full explanation as to why. I, my only, I have a theory about the fact that. There's, if there's an intermediate ID between words and phrases, then maybe that goes away if you have this. But um, I don't know. So anyway, so I was really impressed with that. And actually, this was really kind of eye-opening. Like, wow, if I had done it this way, it would have been even smaller. And we're, we're, I'm plenty happy with 200 megs. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's, at this point, it's an over-optimization to try and improve on it. Um, but I found this to be very interesting. And actually, this, had this, this approach had me thinking about it more. Because when I saw the 41% reduction, if I just had a single FST, I realized that and compaction saved it another 20% in this case, by the way. Um, what I would have done differently. So um, there's something, Lucene 4 has these things called codecs, which allow you to plug in different uh, index implementations for different fields. And there's something called the memory index. And the memory index internally will put the entire um, terms into an FST in memory. Well, once it does that, that's, very, that's, basically, that's basically what I was doing here. But I had to write a whole bunch of code that built the FST myself. Whereas if I had went with this in retrospect, what I could have done is um, basically um, write a custom token filter that creates terms that have you know, New York City, put some special, maybe just put, put a simple space in between each word, and have the Lucene's memory index sort of automatically in the background put the thing in an FST for me. Um, and then the, then the difference is that when I got query time, instead of querying against the FST directly, I have to go through it via Lucene's uh, terms enumeration API, which is um, just a thin layer on top of the FST itself. So the, the tagging side, um, first of all, 
there's really two parts to this. I, I, I need to build the, this FST, this memory structure. But just because I build it doesn't mean the, the problem's not solved. I need to actually write the tagging to use the thing. That's actually the harder part. Um, it was all, they're both hard, but this is the harder part. Um, it, it's complicated to describe, honestly. Um, I, I, I focused on trying to build a single pass algorithm. So instead of going over the input, looking for every one word, two word, three word, or anything silly like that, I, I kind of I basically sort of an approach where as I take each word, I, build, I basically keep a stack of advancing iterators. Um, and as I get each word, I, I try and advance each one. And whenever I can't, I look at the word and I determine if it's a sub-tag of, exist of an existing tag in progress or, and throw it away if so. Um, kind of complicated to describe. And finally measured the performance of the thing. I didn't conduct these measurements. Someone else on the team did. Um, uh, we didn't have an 80 gigabyte machine to run around to, to, to even test the gate tagger. Um, although I, people on the team that have seen both implementations and from memory think that the, um, the FST implementation was roughly about the same as that 80 gigabyte uh, implementation out of gate. Um, and uh, it's much, much faster than the MySQL based approach. Um, we're doing some. Um, analysis lately of uh, how to improve it uh, even some more. And um, we have some more ideas to make it faster. Not listed here is a commercial competitor. We also beat that as well. Um, so how, do I, how did all this, all this code come together? There's basically, I, um, there's not that many classes involved. There's like maybe, I don't know, four or five or something like that. Um, Basically, there's a, there's a few things. I try to keep the Lucene code separate from the Solar-related code if, in any event, I want to separate them. Um, essentially, there's a request handler that, that I call my tagging request handler. Um, and um, in the background, it, it kind of works in a way similar to spell check in that you have to build it, uh, build this, this, this uh, dictionary, this index. Um, it's pretty configurable. Um, you know, for example, uh, the, the text analysis, um, right, right now it's doing some basic lowercase stuff. But if you wanted to do phonetic matching, then this approach uh, me meets that. Um, and, and with our gazetteer, we've got some metadata associated with each record, including confidence a priori. So at the time we build this thing, we often have filter everything below a certain confidence. So that, that way our FST doesn't have records that we've just decided a priori that we're just not going to match against because it's too low confidence. Um, and let me see, um, some partial word phrase, name phrase matching features. Um, and uh, someone else on the team is using, another nice, be nice benefit here is that in the past, for some, this isn't the first project within, for people I work, I, I work with, um, to have a bunch of words that they want to manage and keep track of. So they, you have a corpus of words that you do tagging against, or not necessarily tagging, but, but you have a corpus of uh, entities. And, and there might be person names, there might be place names, there might be whatever names. So with these features, it was suddenly able to, um, uh, even though it's used in an embedded kind of sense within Open Sextant, um, in the bigger picture, if you want to manage a bunch of names that you do tagging on, it's pretty cool to have a web, um, basically to expose this as a web service, essentially, by do tagging just by hitting curls against solar and to manage it and search the data. So that's pretty cool. And here's an example of me using on the command line. I had the tag request handler. Um, some of the parameters I, I reused. And normally it does not take nearly two seconds. That was a warm up issue when it was probably building the FST or something, I don't know. Um, and it basically returns on a list of tags. So we have a start offset, an end offset character, and a bunch of IDs. These are IDs into the gazetteer. Um, and it returns the matching docs. It's not a typical solar query by any means, because a typical solar query, you're, you're matching maybe um, um, you're only getting the top 10 documents, that you only want the top 10 back, even though you match more. But in this case, within the gazetteer setting, they wanted everything. It was very recently put on GitHub under the Open Section Project Solar Text Tagger. Um, it's an independent module. Uh, we're thinking of eventually putting Open Section in all its parts under uh, OSGEO. As an incubator, you know, possibly we've discussed this. No, I haven't formally done it at all. Um, it's independently documented and tested. Um, pretty exciting. Um, so, the main thing I want to want you to take away from this is that FSTs are awesome. They are a tool that enables you to think about how to solve certain problems in ways that you wouldn't solve before. You can put so much stuff in an FST, so much 
data in there that you typically wouldn't think of solving things by putting a lot of data in memory because you'd conceptually think of it taking up too much space. But with an FST, um, you'd be surprised. You'd be, you really have. Um, and I think it should be useful independent of Open Sextant. Um, there's, uh, I, I may or may not try it and see if it can perform as a synonym token filter. That's the other thing that was very, very, very similar to what I was doing is I looked at um, Lucene's synonym, uh, synonym token, token filter. So whenever you add words to a synonym list, um, behind the scenes it's actually using an FST. And that's what it's doing is very similar to what I'm doing. And as it's taking a stream of words, it's looking up its little dictionary and it's swapping in words. I don't, I don't, I don't care about swapping in words. I just want to identify where it is things were found. But it works. It had some limitations of it. It doesn't quite work in the same way that I needed it to. Uh, in particular, I needed um, all overlapping words, um, not an overlapping tag within a, a tag, but ones that were at least partially overlapping. Um, in the Lucene's one, uh, uh, doesn't work that way. So uh, I think that's it. So see you guys later.